Okay, that works. Good, thanks. So, um, so first of all, thank you for a very, very kind introduction. Um, I, I gotta say, it's very fun being at Mount Sinai. This is basically my one year anniversary. Uh, having, having a fantastic time. It's really fun to be part of a place that's, that's growing and, and doing so many positive things. So what I wanna do today is, is give you a little background on why beta cell regeneration, beta cell replacement is suddenly hot in type one diabetes and really in type two diabetes as well. Um, that's not always been the case. What everybody always thought before is that you got your beta cells when you're born and you lose them when you have type one diabetes and that's the end of the story. There's nothing more to talk about because everybody knows that beta cells are terminally differentiated. They can't regenerate, they can't replicate. So if you lose them, that's too bad, uh, you're done. So um, that's clearly not true. It's clearly uh, changing and, and a lot's going on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you some uh, background on sort of the uh, beta cell function in, in, uh, in, in normal people and people with diabetes. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about some of the work that we've done with beta cell regeneration. So with that introduction, let's go. So this is sort of what everybody's always believed. You're born at some point in life you get your beta cells in their first few, uh, actually embryonic life, but also sort of peaking maybe when you're one or two years old, and then you're done, uh, and you stay like that forever unless you have genetic predispos predisposition to getting type one diabetes, and then autoimmunity starts, and you begin to lose beta cells, and by the time uh, you've lost about 80 or 90% of them, you become diabetic, and the autoimmunity inexorably kills all of your beta cells, so that within a few years of becoming diabetic with type one diabetes, you're done. You've lost all your beta cells. So everyone has always believed that forever. Turns out it's not entirely true. So this is a, one of uh, uh, a couple of studies, actually now lots of studies, looking at beta cell mass in, in people with type one diabetes at autopsy. The top study is from UCLA, from Peter Butler, looking at beta cell mass in people after 20 years of type one diabetes. And the, uh, the study, in the, uh, this study is from uh, Jocelyn Clinic, from George, Clin uh, George King, looking at pancreases of people who had type one diabetes for 50 years. They have uh, collected a group of what they call medalists, people with lifelong, almost lifelong diabetes for, for 50 and more years. It turns out when you look at their pancreases and compare them to normal people, normal people, somewhere around one and a half percent of the pancreas is comprised of beta cells and the rest is uh, other things that you all know uh, very well. Uh, what the surprise here is that this number is not zero. Everybody knew that beta cell mass was reduced in diabetes and type 1 diabetes, but nobody thought after 20 and 50 years of type 1 diabetes there would still be beta cells. So that's a surprise, and if you look at it histologically, these are insulin stained, so the brown is insulin. It turns out there's still some beta cells or perhaps new beta cells appearing out in the periphery of the pancreas, so here's one, here's one, here's one. Uh, and they tend to be near um, uh, acinar, uh, you know, uh, ducts out in the periphery of the pancreas, which is where some people think beta cells come from. Uh, there are also still beta cells in the pancreas, or at least insulin positive cells in the pancreas in an islet that obviously is hyalinized and degenerating, but it suggests that maybe there's regeneration going on in this islet 20 years later. And then in the cross section of, of uh, pancreatic ducts, the main duct and, and uh, tributaries of that, there are still insulin positive cells uh, in, the, in the wall of the, uh, uh, in the epithelium of the pancreatic duct. Um, and, and many people think this is where beta cells come from or from cells surrounding the pancreatic duct. So this suggests that it's in fact possible that beta cell regeneration could be occurring. Obviously, you only get one shot at an autopsy, so you can't do longitudinal studies like this, but um, is there any functional data? So this is a study from a woman named uh, Lois Jovanovic Peters, who's in Santa Barbara, who's well known in following type one diabetics uh, who decide to become pregnant and then managing them through pregnancy. So this is a group of young women who had uh, type one diabetes and by definition at the outset, they had, no, um, they had no C-peptide, that's a surrogate for insulin measurements. So they're type one diabetic, they can't make insulin. But during the first trimester uh, of pregnancy, these same women suddenly are making C-peptide. And the idea here is that during pregnancy, obviously you immunosuppress yourself so you won't reject the fetus. And so the implication is that if you could immunosuppress people with type one diabetes, the existing residual beta cells which appear to be regenerating, maybe they can regenerate even more and now you can start making some insulin. This is a study from a, a renal transplant group in Milan um, and, and so what they did is, is something 
uh, a little different than normal. So normally, you get a call saying uh, you're on the waiting list, um, uh, we have a kidney for you, come on in, and you start getting immunosuppressed that night or the day before or early the next morning. What these guys said is, let's, let's do that, that's business as usual, that will be these guys, but let's take a bunch of type 1 diabetics and let's pre-treat them with rapamycin for a month or more before they get their uh, transplant and see if that influences transplant outcomes. And so what they did is they, they took uh, people near the top of their waiting list who had common HLA types, et cetera, so they knew they would be getting transplants soon. Um, and the ones uh, in black got rapamycin. And you can see that over the next four weeks, these people who before weren't making insulin or weren't making C-peptide, some of them suddenly are. So this is, again, functional evidence that uh, if you immunosuppress people with type 1 diabetes, beta cell regeneration can happen. So the, the message from that series of slides is that the, the paradigm that beta, you lose your beta cells, uh, they're gone forever, you lose all of them and they can't regenerate, that appears not to be true. It appears that they have some regenerative potential. It turns out type 1 diabetes from a pharma point of view is, is sort of an orphan disease. Nobody in pharma cares about type 1 diabetes. It's two and a half million people, that's not a big enough market, so it's too bad that they have type 1 diabetes, but pharma hasn't invested in it. So let's talk about type 2 diabetes for a minute. It, it's, 2013, nobody knows the cause of type, one, of type 2 diabetes. Most people think that it's due to insulin resistance. Um, that's clearly part of the story that was described here by Burson and Yallo, actually, for the, for the younger people who don't know that, the notion that type 2 diabetics actually have insulin, they've got a fair amount of insulin. That came as a surprise that led to the Nobel Prize for, uh, for Burson and Yallo. So the idea is that you're resistant to insulin and type 2 diabetes, uh, and, and maybe you have also hypothalamic and metabolic uh, control issues uh, that collectively lead to insulin resistance. Uh, but nobody knows what those genes are, nobody knows what the loci are, nobody knows what the metabolic pathways are. So this is the area of ge era of genome-wide association studies. So let's take 250,000 Europeans and, and Americans and Icelandic uh, people, um, and let's just collect DNA on everybody, we'll scan their genomes, and we'll divide them into groups of people who either do or do not have type 2 diabetes. And we'll find the genetic loci that regulate metabolism and appetite in the brain. We'll find the uh, genes loci that are associated with insulin resistance in fat, muscle, and liver. And then we'll be on the track to figuring out what's going on. So those studies have been done. And it turns out this, this is sort of the first group of, of genes that came out, or loci, and it turns out a lot of them are not, not where they thought. So this is the potassium inert rectifier that regulates insulin secretion. That's the drug target of repaglinite. It's a beta cell gene. This is a beta cell transcri uh, transcription factor. This is a zinc transporter that exists in beta cells. These are cell cycle molecules that exist in beta cells. This is an ER, endoplasmic reticulum gene, <clears throat> that's uh, mutated in children with Wolverham syndrome, and they get beta cell failure and type 1 diabetes. And this is a beta cell transcription factor. So surprise, surprise, what everybody thought was they would be finding brain, liver, muscle, fat genes, loci associated with type, 1, uh, type 2 diabetes. But in fact, most of the genes that they found were, were beta cell associated. Those studies have gone on now, and this is a more recent update. They're actually up to now 70, and in this case, the ones that are circled are beta cell-related uh, loci. And so, um, to, to be fair, you can sort of spin these things in different ways, but I think it's, it's unquestionably true now that the majority of genes associated with, or genetic loci associated with type 2 diabetes are related to beta cells. So what it's telling you is that, <clears throat> um, uh, okay. Well, what, it, what it's telling you is that, in fact, the genetic abnormalities that lead to type 2 diabetes are in part here, but certainly there's a beta cell component. So this is important politically in the world of, of type 1 diabetes and beta cell regeneration because, as I mentioned before, no pharma was interested in beta cell replication or regeneration before. Now every single pharma in the United States is going after the, and, and around the world, is going after type 2 diabetes and beta cell regeneration uh, as, as pharmaceutical targets. I showed you beta cell mass in, in type 1 diabetes. This slide shows beta cell mass in people with type 2 diabetes. So in, in this slide, again, the first the, the slide I'm showing is by Peter Butler, but lots of other people have uh, published similar reports. So if you look at lean people who are not diabetic and measure the percentage of their pancreas that's uh, beta cell mass, it turns out, again, it's somewhere around 1.5%. If you look at obese people uh, who are not diabetic, uh, but died accidental deaths, beta cell mass tends to be higher. If you look at 
uh, demographically matched uh, type 2 diabetics, same gender, same age, same, uh, same everything else. Um, if you look at beta cell mass in type 2 diabetics, it's reduced. And it's reduced about 60% compared to non-diabetic obese controls. And it's even reduced compared to lean controls. So this is now anatomic data that supports the, the, the genomic data that, that indicates that beta cell mass is reduced and beta cell function is reduced, reduced in type 2 diabetes. So suddenly type 2 diabetes has gotten very uh, popular uh, as a, a target for beta cell regeneration. So what I've shown you so far are mean data. Let me just show you individual data. This is from uh, another study by the same guy, Peter Butler at UCLA. Just, just look at the non-diabetic uh, uh, open triangles here. And we're just going to look at beta cell volume here. So again, if you look at normal people, somewhere around 1.5% of, of pancreas mass is, is uh, beta cells. These subjects tend, or, or is, this is a cohort of people who are obese. Um, but some people are down here, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0.7 percent of their pancreas is beta cells, and other people are out here, somewhere around 11 percent. So you can, you can look at these data and say, look, um, uh, well, first of all, let me just say that there's no evidence that beta cell mass expands in people with diabetes, uh, with, with obesity. There is in rodents, but in humans there's good evidence that they don't expand. So um, what it means is that you're born with this amount of beta cell mass if you're that person, uh, or you're born with this amount of beta cell mass. These people, it doesn't matter how much they eat, how uh, insulin resistant they get, they're not going to get diabetes. They've got tons of beta cell reserve. But these people, if they get, you know, five pounds, 10 pounds overweight, suddenly they'll become insulin intolerant and, and uh, potentially diabetic. So these are, uh, these are obese people. This is now looking at lean people. Again, the same guy, Peter Butler. Uh, and and um, if you look at this slide, again, 1.5% is normal. Now he's looking at it as a function of age. So in lean people and obese people, you get your beta cell mass by the time you're two years old, something like that. And then that's what you got for your life that's genetically determined. That's what the GWAS data show. Um, and if you're this person or these people and you become overweight and insulin resistant, you'll get diabetic, diabetes. If you're these people uh, and you become insulin resistant and overweight, you're probably not going to become diabetic. Okay? So, so the central point from these slides is that, um, uh, is that your, your beta cell mass is genetically determined, your risk of diabetes is genetically determined, and it isn't enough just to be insulin resistant. You have to be insulin resistant and not have enough beta cell mass or not have enough beta cell function, okay? So type, and, and just, just to say that in, in a simpler way, we all know that everybody who's overweight is insulin resistant, but only about a third of them ever become diabetic. So there has to be something else going on, and the something else is uh, a genetically reduced beta cell mass, okay? All right. So, um, so now you know that type 1 uh, diabetes is due to beta cell deficiency, but there's some uh, opportunity for regeneration. Type 2 diabetes is now a beta cell deficiency disease. Uh, and now here's another sort of paradigm changing story. You guys probably know this very well, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But it just uh, is important because it went from forget beta cell replacement, it's impossible, to actually maybe it is possible. My interpretation of these studies is, is that um, they, they show that uh, proof of principle wise it's possible to give people new beta cells with type 1 diabetes, but there's still a lot of hurdles. So the initial report, these, these, uh, uh, these folks are from Edmonton in, in Alberta. They're very good at isolating islets, and they decided to stop using glucocorticoids <coughs> as immunosuppression with islet transplant and came up with another regimen, which turned out to be tacrolimus, um, uh, rapamycin, and uh, diclizumab. Um, but the point is they didn't use steroids. Um, if you think about it, it's sort of a no-brainer. Steroids cause diabetes. They're bad for beta cells. They cause insulin resistance. So come, switching to a different regimen makes, makes perfect sense. So they did that. And in the first seven patients, they had wonderful results. The idea is let's harvest cadaver pancreases. We'll digest the islets out. We'll put in a transhepatic catheter. Uh, this is the cadaver donor. This is the recipient. We'll put in a transhepatic catheter, a portal catheter, and squirt the islets in. They're going to float into the periphery of the, uh, of the uh, portal uh, uh, circulation and lodge in the hepatic sinusoids. So they'll be secreting insulin in the hepatic sinusoids. That's pretty good because the pancreas was here originally and it was secreting insulin into the portal vein. So the insulin's going to end up in the same place. That, that's sort of the idea. Um, and so these are their original data. These are the seven patients, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven patients. 
uh, I know you can't see this. All I want you to know is that each patient required two pancreases or four pancreases worth of uh, islets to fix their diabetes. So uh, if, you, if you do the arithmetic, it's pretty simple. In the United States, there are 30 million type 2 diabetics. There are 2.5 million type 1s. There are about 2,000 pancreas donors per year. Many of the pancreases aren't, aren't usable. Um, so if each of these people needs two to four pancreases worth of, of, uh, of, of islets, and there are only this many pancreases available or less, uh, you're going to have to come up with a way to make, uh, make more beta cells or induce endogenous base cell regeneration. So that's changed how people think about this. It turns out that if you follow these people over time, they do really well in the first year, but over time, they lose graft function, they stop making insulin, or they stop making enough insulin to control their diabetes, and by five years out, 92% of them are now off of, uh, uh, have to go back on insulin, so that this is measuring ins people who are insulin free. At the beginning, most of them can come off insulin, but by five years later, more than 90% are back on insulin. So why are they back on insulin? Well, partly it's because of rejection, but partly it's because the immunosuppression regimen is, is, is uh, not well tolerated. They get uh, mouth ulcers in 90% of them, 60% get diarrhea, 52% uh, got acne, about 40% got peripheral edema, and um, this, the, the cohort that they used were mostly 50-year-old lawyers, doctors, and nurses who were sort of medically and legally well-informed and compliant. Um, uh, and they just decided, you know what, it isn't worth it. This has been nice having a holiday from diabetes and not checking my sugar, but I would rather have diabetes than have to live through all these things. So a lot of this failure is, is actually patients stopping drugs. A lot of it is, is allo rejection. And of course, a lot of it is these, these people have autoimmunity to, to beta cells. They have type 1 diabetes, so a lot of it is, is that as well. All right. Um, so the, the point of this study then in, in my world is it shows that if you had decent immunosuppression and if you had a renewable supply of beta cells or it could encourage endogenous beta cell regeneration, then, um, uh, then, then this might have legs therapeutically. So what's the status of this? So there's an NIH-funded uh, consortium called the Clinical Islet Transplant Consortium. These are the members. There's an ongoing trial that actually started in 2004, but was held up for all kinds of technical reasons I won't, I won't bore you with. It's scheduled to be finished this year. The results are supposed to re be released <clears throat> in early, uh, uh, in, in, in like, like March of, of next year. So, so we'll have a sense of how effective this is on a larger scale. Unfortunately, since it was designed in 2004, they used the same immunosuppression regimen that was used in the Edmonton trial. Uh, it's clear now there are probably better uh, immunosuppression protocols. The hope of these groups is that um, they can get enough efficacy data to get the FDA to approve this so that it can be billable by Medicare. These are the sort of status of the sites. I won't go through this, but they'll, they'll, um, they should be finished soon. So we'll know, we'll know the outcome of that. Unfortunately, it's probably not going to tell us the optimal immunosuppressive uh, therapy for islet transplant. So what about whole pancreas transplant? And, and again, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. This is, this is the number of pancreas transplants that are done in the United States during this period. This is all available. This is actually the most recent data on the, on the uh, you know, uh, government website for, uh, for transplants. So around 1,200 pancreas transplants a year. The majority are simultaneous pancreas kidney transplants, but there are some pancreas transplant alone and some pancreas after a kidney. Um, it turns out that the success of these is, is really very good, and I, I'm sure you guys all know this, but um, uh, you, if you look at people who are getting simultaneous pancreas kidneys, which is the most common, um, the graft survival at five years is, is around, uh, around 75%. Again, these are people transplanted in 2006, uh, so five-year follow-up brings it to 2011. Again, this is the most recent data on the, on the federal website that oversees this. Um, uh, so what this means in, in, in the beta cell replacement world, or regeneration world, is the bar is getting higher and higher. Every sort of uh, decade cohort of these studies, the, the outcomes are better and better and better. So it means that if you're going to do either transplant, you're going to have to do at least this well. Um, uh, and so that's, that's sort of the target. But also just to make the point that pancreas transplant is widely done and, and um, uh, is effective. Um, okay, so, so what about stem cells? I mean, why don't we just make stem cells? So embryonic stem cells have their political issues. Now people are using induced pluripotent stem cells made from skin fibroblasts. 
Um, and so the question is, how do, you, how do you take an embryonic stem cell or an ES cell or an IPS cell and turn it into an endocrine pancreatic cell that makes insulin, a beta cell? So this field is moving really rapidly. This is sort of a, one of the most recent articles on this from a company called Viasite in San Diego, which is one of the leaders in this field. Um, and so it used to be difficult to get cells to move from uh, embryonic stem cells to mesoendoderm to definitive endoderm to posterior foregut uh, to, 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 to primitive uh, gut to, to posterior foregut. Now this is routine. Everybody who was in this field can do this. It's being done all over the world. The barrier now is right here. You can get primitive foregut cells, uh, and, but you, nobody's been able to make them uh, differentiate into endocrine pancreas cells to beta cells in a dish. People have been able to take these cells, transplant them into mice, and then see what happens. And it turns out in vivo in mice, this is a little, can you, I don't know if it's possible to turn the lights down a little bit, but just in this slide, it's hard to see in this light, but there's a lot of blue cells here. Those are beta cells, uh, but there are also somatostatin cells and glucagon cells. So the point I want to leave you with here for embryonic stem cell uh, generation or IPS cell generation of beta cells is, Amazing progress has been made over the last decade, but no one's gotten all the way in a dish. The best you can do is transplant these into mice, generate some beta cells in mice, uh, in, the, in the kitties of mice where they're transplanted. Um, but but I, I guess, I guess my, my take on this is there's a lot of room for optimism. If they got this far in 10 years, it's hard to believe they're not gonna make the last few steps in, in uh, the next few years. So I think this has legs. Um, okay. Here's, here's the, the non-biologic approach. So if you're a type 1 diabetic, it's common to wear an insulin pump. So there's a, there's a sub-Q catheter that uh, uses a previously programmed pump with, a, with an insulin syringe in it. And you can give basal insulin this way. Plus, you can also uh, give yourself boluses that you've calculated you'll need for this amount of calories or this amount of carbs, et cetera. So this is, this is the pump. It's widely used uh, in type 1 diabetes. And it's also used a lot in type 2 diabetes. The next addition is glucose, uh, addition is um, uh, glucose sensors. So people now can wear glucose sensors. They send information on your interstitial uh, fluid glucose uh, to this thing, and then you can push a button on this, and you can just, just look and see what your blood sugar is. You can see what the trend has been for the last you know, uh, half an hour, the last day, the last week, whatever you want. Um, uh, and so now, you, and the, the third part of this is you have a brain, so you can see the gl glucose data, you know you're about to eat, you're getting basal insulin, now you can program this thing or, or push buttons on it and say, I want this much insulin because I'm about to eat in a few minutes. So this is so-called, um, uh, well, th this is, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. It's, it's, a, it's an insulin pump and a glu uh, glucose sensor. Wouldn't it be nice if you didn't need a brain, right? I mean, wouldn't it be nice if this would just take care of itself? Why couldn't you have the glucose information go to this thing as it already is, put in computer algorithms uh, into the pumps that would basically interpret the blood glucose data over the last few, a few hours or days, and then just tell the pump what to do? Why, why would you need a brain? So that's, that's called artificial pancreas. That's actually being uh, developed in a lot of places. In Europe, it's already in clinical trials. In the United States, it was just approved by the FDA to do outpatient clinical trials in the so-called closed loop system or artificial pancreas. Uh, and it's the, 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 the studies are, are pretty clear. If you're doing this overnight while you're asleep, guess who has better, better outcomes? Uh, the, the, the artificial pancreas that's figuring out what your glucose is and giving you the right amount of insulin, or you who's asleep unconscious. Obviously, these things outperform sleeping people. Uh, and so now, and that's all been done on GCRCs in hospitals. So now um, the FDA has agreed to allow outpatient clinical trials uh, with these. So there are a few sites around the country that are doing these. Politically, it's pretty interesting. I do a lot of speaking for the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation, and, and, and so I ask when I show this kind of slide, so, so what do you think? I mean, is this, is this, is this uh, suit your needs for diabetes? And some people say, you know, I've been waiting all my life for this. I can't wait to have it. I want to have it. Are, I mean, I'm already using this. I'd love now to have the full uh, closed loop system, artificial pancreas. Other people say, no way. You know, I don't want a pacemaker. I don't want a, I don't want a device. I want to be like you. I want to have no diabetes. I want, uh, you know, I don't want this. I'll wait till the real thing comes out. Uh, okay, all right, so now, now we know that type 1 and type 2 diabetes are both due to beta cell deficiency, so the question becomes how can we add, replace, expand beta cell mass in humans? 
Um, some people might say, look, we have insulin, we have oral hypoglycemics, what more do we need? If you say that to a diabetic audience, uh, which, which now numbers some, you know, 30 million people and uh, another 50 million on the, on the border of type 2 diabetes, um, uh, that, that's simply unacceptable. And the truth is, e even with the best care, we don't do a good job of managing diabetes anywhere. Whole pancreas transplant works, but it has lots of, lots of issues that we can talk about if you're interested. The closed loop pump is now on outpatient trials uh, and, in the U.S. and, and uh, in, in Europe. Embryonic stem cells, IPS, and then turning other cells into liver cells and pancreas cells. People are trying to do that. Um, people have made a few beta cells these ways. Nobody's made enough to treat diabetes. Pig and primate uh, islet transplant xenografts, we can talk about that as well. The main issue there is, is logistical. You need to have a GMP quality sterile pig farm with 10,000 head of pigs uh, that's GMP sterile uh, and, and that's more expensive than developing a drug. So that's, uh, that's most people aren't investing in that uh, intellectually or financially, but some are, notably Bernard Herring at University of Minnesota who's really sort of driving this agenda. Um, cadaveric human islets you've heard about. Uh, are, uh, so, so there just aren't enough cadaveric human islets to, to treat all the people who need them. So our thought was, let's, let's try and understand uh, if they won't regenerate, why not? And we got into this through, um, through mouse models, transgenic mouse models. So um, we discovered this protein called PTH-related protein. It turns out it's made in the islets. So we decided to make transgenic mice using the rat insulin promoter and overexpress PTHRP specifically in the um, in the islets of these mice. And the phenotype is they get these giant islets, they make too much insulin, and they get hypoglycemic. So this turns out to be the first example of a growth factor delivered in vivo to beta cells that can expand beta cell mass and function and proliferation. So we were excited about that, went on and made some other mouse models that I, that I won't talk about. But as we got more and more into this, we realized that it turns out there are differences between humans and, and mice. So um, in, in mice and rats, pancreatic islets look like this. This is the picture that's in every textbook of human diabetes. Uh, it turns out not to be human. So there's a core of beta cells, the insulin producing cells. They comprise about 90% of the islet. And then there's a mantle around, surrounding the islets uh, that, that are alpha cells that make the glucagon and, and somatostatin cells or delta cells that, that make somatostatin. It turns out human islets look, look completely different. <clears throat> First of all, they're only about 40% beta cells. Um, second of all, they have lots more alpha cells, glucagon cells, and the architecture is totally different. All the cell types are mixed together. Here, beta cells only touch beta cells for the most part. Here, beta cells are mostly touching other cell types besides beta cells. Um, and then these black holes are where pancreatic duct uh, termini come. So there are ductal cells in here. There are blood vessels, capillaries, endothelial cells, et cetera. Okay? So morphologically, they look different. It turns out uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was impossible to make rodent beta cells replicate. Now it turns out you can. And so lots of people now have found lots and lots of things that make rodent beta cells replicate. So glucose does. We showed that placentalactogen, PTHRP, and HGF does. Um, and then other people have added lots of things to this list. This is the newest thing, beta trophin. Um, so this is the list of the, whatever it is, 50 or so molecules that make rodent beta cells replicate. Here's the list of ones that work in humans. So it turns out no one has got a way, no one has got a small molecule, a drug, a biologic, a peptide that can make human beta cells replicate. I'm just thinking about time. So, so how are we doing time-wise? Doing great. What, what, how much time do you think we should get? Take your time. <laughs> All right, good. All right. All right, so, so what is it about human beta cells that, that won't allow them to replicate? So in, in rodents, lots of things, aside from drugs, make them uh, replicate. During embryologic life, they expand. During neonatal uh, period in rodents, beta cells replicate. If you do partial pancreatectomy in a rodent, they'll regenerate. So this is like classic model. If you do a hemipancreatectomy on a rodent, they'll grow a new exocrine and endocrine pancreas in, in another two weeks. You can do a 90% pancreatectomy. They'll grow a whole new pancreas and new endocrine pancreas as well in three or four weeks. If you put them on a high-fat diet and make them obese, or if you put them on a genetic background that makes them obese, or if you do other things to make them insulin resistant, like knock out insulin receptor, um, they increase beta cell mass to compensate, and sometimes they have enormous increases in beta cell mass. And during pregnancy, pregnancy is a state of insulin resistance, so in rodents, rodents compensate by doubling or tripling their number of beta cells through, through replication. And you need to add gaps by half. Uh, well, yeah, well, well, actually, hang on to that. Let, let's talk about that at the end, if you want. So, 
that, that's what we'll talk. Um, so these are the ones that increase beta cell mass. Oh, oh, so in rodents, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, but, but in humans, that, that's another question. Um, so uh, th these are the maneuvers that actually increase human beta cell mass. And basically, as I said before, you get your beta cells when you're a kid, an embryo, and a neonate, and after that you're done. And none of these things increase beta cell mass much in humans. So um, this is the slide I showed you before with obese people with type 2 diabetes or obese people who are just uh, non-diabetic and have this big increase in beta cell mass. Is there any replication going on here? The answer is no. So this is KI-67. It's a marker of replication in the obese, non-diabetic people, the obese type 2 diabetic people, and the lean people. The beta cell replication rates are all about the same. And I guess the most important point on this slide is this number isn't any different than zero. There's basically no replication going on to speak of in type 2 diabetes or obesity. And that's different than what happens in rodents. Uh, the same guy, Peter Butler, who's now getting a reputation as an ambulance chaser, uh, now is collecting pancreases from pregnant women who died accidental deaths. And so in rodents, uh, beta cell mass triples during pregnancy. Uh, what he found is that in humans, beta cell mass goes up a little bit, about 40%, but none of it's due to beta cell replication. Again, these numbers are essentially zero. Um, and all of the increase in beta cell mass is due to the appearance of clusters of one or two or three individual beta cells out of the periphery of the pancreas. So in, in human uh, pregnancy, beta cell mass increases a little bit, but none of it's due to beta cell replication. This is a study by a guy named uh, Joris Meyer, who is, is in Germany. Uh, and he decided to look at, since pancreatectomy is a, is a standard model for beta cell regeneration in, in rodents, what, about, what happens to humans? So he took people who had been to the OR for, some of them had uh, masses in the tail of their pancreas, so they had a partial pancreatectomy because of that. Some of them um, uh, had pancreatitis and had a pancreatic pseudocyst removed, but they left normal pancreas intact. And so he, he did a CT scan uh, post-op at, or, or the people had CT scans post-op, and then at some point, uh, uh, this is immediately post-op, and then, and then later post-op at intervals shown here, uh, they'd have a second one. So over, over at least the period of around a year, but some of them went out several years, there's no evidence that the uh, pancreas, pancreatic uh, remnant in increased in size. Um, if you then went back and did a second surgery, so some people had to go in and ha have a second surgery, so they took out part of the, uh, of the stump that remained, if you will, of the pancreas, and they looked at beta cell mass, and it was about 1% in people at the time of the first surgery. It was about the same uh, uh, post-op. In rodents, this number would have gone up here, but in humans, apparently, not much happens. And then when they looked at beta cell replication in, in these, uh, the original resected pancreas and in the patients who had second operations, uh, the, the residual pancreas, again, beta cell replication rates are extremely low. So this suggests that in human beings, neither exocrine nor endocrine pancreas can regenerate. And then this, this is a study by, um, it, it's Betsy Sequist and, uh, and, and Paul Robertson on the, on the endocrine side, but this is uh, David Sutherland, I mean Donald Sutherland, uh, at, at the University of Minnesota, uh, where they were doing for a while. So if, if, um, if Brian and I are buddies and he's a type 1 diabetic and we like each other, maybe I just give him half of my pancreas for his type 1 diabetes. So these are sort of uh, uh, living uh, unrelated donor uh, hemi, hemi pancreatectomies uh, to treat type 1 diabetes. And so they decided, after having done that for a while, to go back and find the 21 people that they had done this with, the donors, uh, six they couldn't find, but they found 15. Of those 15, two were already known to be diabetic and were on meds. And then they brought the other 13 in. Six were clearly not diabetic. One had impaired glucose tolerance. Two had impaired fasting glucose. Th uh, three had both. And another one was found to be diabetic who wasn't, wasn't previously known to be diabetic. <clears throat> so out of these 15 people who donated half their pancreas, 60% developed diabetes or glucose intolerance or impaired fasting glucose. So that says that, again, uh, unlike what happens in rodents where you would grow a new pancreas and you have plenty of beta cells, if you lose half your pancreas, you, you've already put yourself at sort of 60% risk of developing diabetes. The numbers are small. There are lots of caveats. These are people who are maybe not as lean as New Yorkers if they're from Minnesota, et cetera, et cetera. But um, uh, it, it makes the point that there's not uh, enormous regeneration going on. So then this is sort of beta cell replication, again, KI67 uh, as, as a marker of beta cell replication. 
during life. This is by Chris Rhodes, who's at the University of Chicago, and in embryonic life, there's a little bit of replication, but not much. In the first few months postpartum, there is some replication going on, and then within you know, the first year or two, it basically good, dials down back to close to zero, and then it stays that way for your life. So the message now is, is that beta cells can regenerate, uh, at least in neonates, uh, they can replicate, but it's, it's pretty tightly controlled, and, and it stops pretty early in life, and you get your beta cells when you're a little, uh, when you're a little kid. And this is just another, this again, this is Peter Butler uh, talking about beta cell replication in children. His number is in neonates is somewhere around two and a half, three percent. But by the time you're a year or two old, it goes down to basically zero. All right. And, and again, I won't talk about the mice, but mice are different. So, so the message here is that this, I showed you this slide before, but now, now you know that you get this amount of beta cells by the time you're two years old. Uh, that's what you got for life. They don't <laughs> replicate during your life. And um, this is genetically determined. This is what you get. Uh, if, you, if you lose it because you've got autoimmunity, um, you're going to have a tough time regenerating them, although now there's evidence that some regeneration can happen. Um, if you genetically get this amount of beta cells and you get overweight, you'll probably get diabetes. If you genetically get this amount of beta cells uh, and get overweight, you probably won't get diabetes. All right? So that's sort of how, how things look from our perspective. So what, what I'm telling you is that the, the replicative engine in beta cells seems to be turned off. No one seems to be able to get it going. So we said, look, I mean, if, if this were your car, you'd pop the hood and you'd see what's going on inside the engine and see if you got, you know, see if you got ignition wires and a fuel pump and see if you got a fan belt and, uh, you know, ignition uh, motor, et cetera, and all the things an engine's supposed to have. So for cell cycle and proliferation, this is the engine compartment. So this, this is cell cycle. Uh, these are, are the carburetors and fuel injectors that make cells go, et cetera. So the green molecules are molecules that make cells proliferate in general. And the red molecules are ones that uh, inhibit proliferation, cell cycle inhibitors. So these are known from cancer cells and fibroblasts and yeasts and other, other kinds of species. So we decided just to catalog them for uh, the human islet. Uh, and it turns out that human islets have all the machinery that ought to make beta cells replicate, but clearly they don't. Um, on the other hand, when we look at cell cycle inhibitors, they also have all the cell cycle inhibitors uh, that, that would prevent proliferation. So the surprising thing here is that most of these cell cycle inhibitors are present in, in most cells in the body, but usually there's one or two in this family and one or two in this family and one or two in this family. But most cells don't have every single cell cycle inhibitor uh, present and turned on. So if you like, this is the recipe for how to make a cell that won't proliferate. Get the clone tech catalog, get the DNA encoding every cell cycle inhibitor, put it in your favorite cell, and it won't be able to replicate. So we said, OK, now, now we sort of have, have, uh, have, a, have a wiring diagram to work with. What would happen if we took cyclins, so the three, cyclin D1, D2, and D3, and cyclin-dependent kinases, uh, the active component of this complex, so there's CDK4 and CDK6, what would happen if we took all these things, put them in adenovirus, and then stuck them in human islets, uh, would, we see, uh, would we see phosphorylation of RB, that's the kinase target, and would we see proliferation, would we see cell cycle entry? So we did that, and um, here's what happened. So, BRDU is a measure of proliferation of DNA synthesis. Insulin staining measures insulin. So we can take human islets, which by the way we get, there's an NIH supported uh, human islet distribution network for people who do research in diabetes. It's called the IIDP. So we get islets from IIDP that are isolated at uh, uh, pancreatic islet transplant centers around the country. They send us islets. If we stain them for insulin, they have insulin. If we look for proliferation, there isn't any. If we do anything we can think of to them in terms of growth factors, they won't proliferate. Um, if we put in control adenoviruses, so this is an adenovirus expressing beta-galactosidase, there's no proliferation. But if we put in adenovirus with cyclin D1, D2, or D3, or combinations of D1 with CDK4, et cetera, et cetera, or D1 with CDK6, et cetera, et cetera, there's beta cell replication going on all over the place. So this is a significant picture because this is the first time anybody's ever shown robust rates of human beta cell replication. So, so we were excited about that. 
Um, of course, you, you probably know and probably think, like many people do, that if you drive proliferation, you're also going to force dedifferentiation because, for example, most cancers that are aggressively proliferating are also pretty dedifferentiated. So part of the mindset, first, first dogma was beta cells don't replicate, don't try that. It's, it's a bad idea. It can't happen. Truth is, on the PTHRP side, we didn't know it was a bad idea, so we just did it. Uh, and it worked. And then when we got to this, people said, well, you can't make them replicate. And we said, well, you know, no one's looked in the engine compartment, so, so let's find out what's wrong and try and manipulate that. So sure enough, they can repl replicate. And now the question is, well, look, if you make them replicate, particularly if you make them replicate at these high rates, they're going to de-differentiate, they're going to become crummy beta cells, they won't work. So we decided we needed to prove how well they work. We showed that they make insulin, they do all the things beta cells should do in vitro. But we thought, and this just shows the replication rates. Replication rates are really high compared to the controls. So we said, um, let's, let's do this. Let's take skid mice. So these are mice with no immune system, so we can put human islets in them. We'll make them diabetic by giving them streptozoticin and killing their beta cells. So now they've got blood sugars of around 430 or whatever this is. Normal postprandial blood sugars in a mouse are somewhere around here, and fasting sugars are down around here. So they're very diabetic, and if we do nothing else, they stay diabetic. And then we said, well, how many human islets does it take to fix a diabetic mouse? And we played around with different doses of human islets, and it turns out that about 1,500 human islets, uh, just plain old human islets, or human islets transduced with a mock adenovirus, bring the blood sugar down marginally, bring it down a little bit. And so that was what we wanted, because now we could add CDK6 and second D1 adenovirus to other aliquots of these same islets and see if it made them worse, which would make them more diabetic, didn't change them, or made them better. And you can see in the green line, obviously, putting CDK6 and cyclin D1 into human islets and then transplanting them clearly makes them work better. And to get normal human islets to work this well, you have to put in 4,000 uh, human islets. So this is surprise, surprise. It turns out you can have it both ways. You can drive human beta cell replication at high rates, and it doesn't make them less good, less effective at controlling diabetes. It, in fact, makes them better, and it makes them approximately three times better because you need three times as many islets to, to get the, the, the glycemic control to be that good. So we transplant islets into the renal capsule, uh, and the reason we do that is, A, it's easy, B, the renal cortex is highly vascularized, but, but it also means that we can also do a unilateral nephrectomy and pull out the kidney with a human graft in it in a mouse. And if you do that, then they become diabetic again. So this is important because it means that the, um, the human graft with the CDK6, cyclin D3 is what's controlling their sugar, not, uh, not regeneration of their endogenous mouse pancreas. It also means we can inject them with BRDU, and we can look at uh, proliferation in these graphs uh, when we take them out. And again, it's, it's bright in here. These are low power views, just to give you an idea. That's a beta cell, that's a beta cell, that's a beta cell. These are big cysts that are made by the ductal cells we transplant. This is a control. But if you look at human islets that are transduced with cyclin D1 and CDK6, there's beta cell replication going on all over the place. And so the, the message from this slide is that you really can have it both ways. You can drive human beta cell replication artificially, to be sure, using cell cycle molecules, induce replication in vitro, and they work, as they work fine in vitro. They work fine in vivo. And you can have sustained replication for, this, this is out six weeks, um, uh, for, for a long period of time and, and still have uh, excellent control of, of blood glucose. Um, and, and then finally, this is the first time anybody's ever seen robust human beta cell replication going on in vivo if, if you'll accept human beta cells in a, in a skid mouse as, as in vivo. So I'm not going to, so, so we, we've moved more into sort of the cell biology, all of this, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to say more about that, but I just, I just want to leave you with the notion that now we know a lot about cell cycle control and how to manipulate it and make beta cells replicate. We also know that when we add things to the outside of human beta cells, like lactogens or growth factors, or this is Bietta, Xenin 4, GLP-1, or glucose, these are all things that make rodent beta cells replicate, but they don't engage cell cycle machinery in humans. So for me, that means that either these, these receptors are not present on islets, or the signaling pathways aren't working, or the signaling pathways work, but somehow can't interact with the cell cycle machinery. So those are the kinds of things we're working on now. Uh, maybe the signaling pathways are different. Maybe human islets have even more cell cycle inhibitory tone, so we can, we can take all of these, these cell cycle inhibitors out. We're doing that. 
Um, there's a trafficking story that I haven't gone into that's, I think, very important. Um, and and uh, uh, maybe, maybe we just haven't found the right receptors for the right growth factors in small molecules. So I think I'll skip all this stuff. Um, just, just to acknowledge that people do the work. Um, the, these, the, all these people were in Pittsburgh with me. They all came to Mount Sinai with me. Um, Natalie did most of the stuff that I showed you. Karen makes the adenoviruses. Karen uh, is Hawaiian. She went to Punahou Academy, and turns out she went to school with Barack Obama. And uh, she was in the same class. And when we were in Pittsburgh and, and Obama began his uh, campaign and his name became visible, she came in with her yearbook one day and said, this is like, you know, this guy Barack, that's Barry. So Barry was at Punahou. She has a picture of him in the yearbook with his, uh, you know, basketball singlet on. Um, and uh, anyway, that's Karen. She makes all our viruses. It turns out we can't find her birth certificate either. Um, and then and these other guys, I'm not going to go through them one-on-one. -on -one, but that's what we do. And... Um, this is all supported by NIDDK and Juvenile Diabetes Foundation. We get our eyelets from the, eyelet, the IIDP that I mentioned, and this is an NIH uh, sort of consortium of beta cell investigators. So let me stop there, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. <laughs>